Hey guys, Jayon King here. Um, I'm going to be continuing to uh, zip through the chapters. Um, you guys don't have a lot of time left of the competition. Good luck, guys. Um, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. So, without further ado, let's get right into chapter 9. Alright, so chapter 9. So chapter 9 talks about different types of research. Um, how do we investigate what's going on with the brain and the nervous system? There are a lot of different ways we do this, obviously. We image our brain, we use animals, um, gene diagnosis, right? Um, but I know what you guys are thinking. Imaging is going to be tested a lot, and you're right, imaging is going to be tested a lot. So before I get into the other stuff, I'm going to talk about the imaging first. So the first technology technique I want to talk about is MRI. MRI is, prop is really, really famous. You guys have heard of this. Um, so MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. So how it works, um, essentially you stick a person inside of a magnet, um, you have a background mag magnetic field going on, and that um, lines up all the atoms in your brain. Then you're going to have a second magnetic field um, pulsing, right? You know, it's going to turn on and off, right? And as that happens, your atoms are going to uh, line up with that field, and then when it's turned, and as the field is turned off, it's going to go back to the background magnetic field. Um, as you do that, though, um, you're going to have the release of signals, um, and computers can pick up that signal and trans those signals and translate it to an image. So, using MRI, then you get an image by basically. So you use magnetic fields to play around with atoms, and then you get an image from that. So the critical thing to remember here is that um, in MRI images, tissues with a lot of water and fat are going to appear bright, and then tissues that don't have a lot of that stuff are going to appear dark. Um, so why is this so important? Well, you can use MRI to uh, figure out the interconnectivity of different parts of the brain just based on the fact that areas with a lot of fat and water appear bright. For example, diffusion tensor imaging is an MRI technique that um, is able to uh, look at fiber tracks that connect different parts of the brain together. And fiber tracks have a lot of water, so these fiber tracks are going to appear brighter. Um, so using diffusion tensor imaging and MRI techniques, you can see how different areas of the brain connect with each other. So MRI has a lot of practical applications besides you know, simply taking an image of the brain. Um, the next one I want to talk about, um, MRS, or magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is a technique closely related to MRI, and it uses the same technology, but instead of measuring um, uh, you know, different areas um, of the brain connecting with each other, it looks at the concentration of specific chemicals, such as neurotransmitters. So why is this so important? Well, um, a lot of different uh, diseases uh, involve the uh, decrease or increase of different types of neurotransmitters, and you can use MRS to figure, figure out what's going on in that kind of situation. Um, essentially, you can track the progression of a disease um, over time. Um, and then you have another cousin of MRI, um, fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. So the main uh, role of fMRI that I want you guys to know is uh, uh, oxygen levels. fMRI essentially measures oxygen levels, um, and using this, um, you can track uh, brain activity in certain regions, because if an area is... Um, being really active, it's receiving a lot of fresh blood with a lot of uh, oxygen. And fMRI has the ability to track this, so you can see uh, what's going on. Um, let's see, another technology um, you have to know, uh, MEG, magnetoencephalography. So magnetoencephalography is actually a pretty recent technology, but essentially what it does is it takes um, uh, weak magnetic fields emitted by neurons, um, and it's going to... Uh, take uh, take uh, measure the uh, magnetic fields at like every millisecond or so it's essentially taking like snapshots of um, snapshots of the uh, magnetic fields uh, at the neurons so when you do this um, you're going you're, you can figure out um, what's going on um, for in terms of neural activation um, you can figure out um, the quant you can figure out uh, the strength of a particular activity inside of the brain um, and an exciting development that's been going on recently, they're trying to, people, science seven trying to combine fMRI and MEG technologies. So that's really cool. Um, so another major technology you should know um, is uh, PET or positron emission tomography. Um, so what that is, is um, it measures blood flow or energy consumption. Um, and the way it does this is um, it's going to measure uh, radioactivity or radioact. Uh, uh, it's going to me measure the breakdown of positrons in certain regions of the regions of the brain. Um, when you have um, uh, certain areas of the brain, um, uh, you know, 
consuming a lot of energy or receiving a lot of blood, you're going to see a lot of radioactive uh, stuff going on in there. You're going to see a lot of breakdown of positrons. And PET takes advantage of this by, um, by, by measuring on that, that, radioactive, that radioactivity. Um, so by doing this, um, PET scans have the ability to figure out, hey, is a certain part of the brain uh, not getting enough energy, is not getting enough blood? And this is obviously important in a thing in a disease like stroke. So yeah, PET um, has a lot of practical applications. Um, the last imaging technology as to, uh, uh, Im technology I want to talk about is optical imaging. Um, so optical imaging, um, they kind of uh, brush they kind of brush this topic in the book. Um, the two main uh, subsets of optical imaging that um, they talked about was NIRS and um, sorry uh, NIRS and uh, TMS. So uh, NIRS um, is near infrared spectroscopy. Essentially, what they do is um, the technicians are going to shine lasers through the skull at uh, different frequencies, and areas with uh, a lot of oxygen are going to absorb uh, these frequencies differently than areas that don't have as much oxygen. And they can tell um, uh, what's going on in terms of blood flow just by seeing um, how the light is reflected differently at certain parts. Um, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That's essentially uh, you shock your, you shock the brain. Uh, you see how the brain uh, responds to that, and then you can measure um, that to measure that response to see um, uh, what's happening uh, at a specific brain region in terms of like behavior or something. Yeah. So TMS um, TMS is also really cool. Uh, so yeah, that's just that's just a quick brush down of all the different. That's just a quick rundown of all the different. Uh, imaging technologies that they covered in the book. Um, it's good to know uh, a lot of those before uh, the contest. All right, so now let's talk about um, animals. So obviously, um, people use a lot of different types of animals for neuroscience research. Um, we can't experiment on humans, right? Um, so in animal research, um, people have actually found a lot of different ways um, to creatively, creatively use um, animals for research. Um, for example, Rats and mice, we use them to study uh, different neurotransmitters. Um, rabbits and cats, we use them to study senses, especially vision. You already know from chapter four that we use sea slugs to study learning and memory. Um, we use fruit flies for a lot of research because um, fruit flies, their nervous system is actually pretty similar to ours, especially um, when you look at the eye. Um, and we use zebrafish to uh, study developmental neuroscience because uh, their eggs are clear. The point is, um, the animal world provides us a whole uh, uh, lot of uh, creatures to use um, for neuroscience research. Um, so the few examples of uh, good animal research that I want you to know. Um, Nobel laureate Eric Kandel. Uh, Mr. Kandel um, did research on uh, the sea slug. He was the one who found that um, the chemical mechanisms of learning and memory are pretty much the same whether you look at a sea slug or a human. Um, so Mr. Kandel was able to uh, use uh, sea slugs effectively in learning and memory. So that's a good example of animal research. Another one I want you to know, Arvid Carlson. Nobel laureate Arvid Carlson did uh, research on pigeons and he used pigeons to figure out uh, that the basal ganglia was the area that was being targeted in Alzheimer's patients. And scientists were able to use this research to develop levodopa, uh, the cure for Parkinson's, or, or well not a cure, but like a medicine for Parkinson's. So that's cool. Um, also, I want you to know about uh, David Hubo and uh, Torsten Weasel. Um, Weasel. Um, these guys uh, used monkeys and cats to uh, determine what was going on for amblyopia. Um, uh, and they were able to find out that amblyopia um, is best cured when early in life at age eight. So they used, monkey so they used monkeys and cats to do this, so good job, uh, Mr. Hubo. Mr. Weasel. Mr. Hubo and... Uh, Mr. Weasel. So, a, a good question that you guys have had lately, um, what's the difference between strabismus, strabismus and amblyopia? Um, I had to, actually had to look this up a bit to figure it out, but essentially what it is is um, strabismus is the disease and the condition that it causes is amblyopia. So just, just keep that in mind. Just a bonus. Um, they probably won't test that, but you know, it's still good to know. All right, so now we've gone through the animals, we've gone through the imaging, right? Now it's time to, to talk about uh, genes. Ah, the importance of genes in neuroscience.
you know, genes, as they say in biology, really do determine everything, right? Um, a lot of disorders, more than 7,000 of them, actually, um, for the brain, actually are suspected to have a genetic basis. Actually, the book gave you a ton of examples um, of uh, neuro neurological uh, disorders that are genetic. Um, Huntington's, Huntington's disease, you know, HTT, right? Um, retinoblastoma, RB1, um, DMD, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right? Um, I can keep going on, right? Uh, FMR1 gene, right? That's fragile X, right? Um, 22Q deletion syndrome. Um, uh, and then you have uh, chromosome 16, where a certain portion of it's deleted, you get symptoms similar to Alzheimer's. Uh, L1S1, um, when you have mutations in the L1S1 gene, you get lysencephaly and you, your brains become smoother than normal and you might have seizures. Um, TSC1 and TSC2, uh, uh, tuberous uh, sclerosis complex. Um, Rett syndrome, uh, MCP2. The point is um, that the point is you have a lot of uh, genes um, responsible for a lot of different neurological disorders and many uh, disorders of the brain have a genetic basis so it's important that we study genes. So, um, so just a general uh, word of advice when you guys get to the contest uh, please know the basics of uh, genes and like you know DNA and stuff like that like please know that DNA stands for like you know deoxyribonucleic acid, ACGT, uh, ad adenine, uh, cytosine, guanine, thymine. Just remember the basics guys. Um, they might ask that. Um, remember that you have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom and 23 from dad. Um, just you know, keep that in mind. Um, the brain bee um, often tests uh, basics um, just as much as it tests like complicated details. So it's really great um, to uh, remember the basics as much as um, the complicated stuff. The basics are enough to get you through um, at least half the contest. So yeah, so now that we've covered um, the first half of the book, one through nine, it's time to move on to uh, the part that I personally like much better, 10, 10 through uh, 15. That part um, is about diseases, um, just the different types of diseases that we can suffer. And this is the part where um, I think you guys are going to really enjoy um, learning the material. So um, good luck, guys. Uh, I'll see you soon.